Well, hello everybody. How's it going? Hopefully, yep, here it is. Just testing. I actually changed streaming software back to OBS Studio, so I'm just making sure that everything's working. I also changed how I... Hang on. There we go. Changed how I have things kind of set up on the, sh on the stream scene itself. So, hi. Sorry, I'm feeling a bit exasperated because things were not going right. At the, at the like right before. It wasn't, and great news, it had nothing to do with Streamlabs this time. Because I'm not using OBS this time I'm using... I mean, I'm not using Streamlabs OBS slobs. I'm using just OBS Studio. So, okay, well, today we are playing a little multiplayer room world, or at least trying to, and going to be talking about some stuff in the game. I mean, stuff PTSD related. Sorry, I'm tweaking things behind the scenes. And I'm joined today by... My co-host, Chalice Mike. Say hello, Chalice Mike. Hmm. What for? I know hear you. Well, you're not acting. Your mic turned unmuted, but I don't actually see you talking. It's not because you're muted. So, not sure. Not for a second. But I'm not sure what it was. I don't think it was. Just have to wait and see. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know how this machine worked. Clearly, we just don't know how these things work. <laughs> it's not like we... we it's, it's, like, it's, it's like we never do this. So, I think the problem... Is something on his side because I've seen it, seen him exit now, change channels a couple times. Yay! So if you're 
just popping in, new to the channel. I'm I'm Guthron. This is this is my Monday stream where we talk about important things. A couple of things that if you're a return viewer, you're going to notice is one: there are no alerts going on because I forgot to get the thing from Streamlabs OBS to post it in here. So there are no alerts going on today, and there is no bot because I'm switching bots. I'm, I'm trying to just get away from Streamlabs entirely. So I'm in the process of, of using Phantom Bot, switching to Phantom Bot, but before I can bring it in, bring it online and put it in here, I have to finish right, setting up. Oh, hey, there he is. Uh, a dial on my preamp got bumped just enough to switch it away from the digital mixer. Hmm. So, so then I, ha I have something just for you, but if you're not okay. listening to the stream, you're not going to hear it, but I'll play it no. one more time. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know how this machine worked. It was the... Oh, do I need to turn the stream on? No, no, no. Uh, I'll tell you what it said. It's just uh, Star-Lord doing his little scene from the first uh, movie where he says, I'm sorry, I didn't know how this machine worked. <laughs> it's so. stupid because I... So I, I, at, the, at the time I had Studio One open... Um, which is the, the recording software that that came with my my gear? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it may not be professional or even most amateurs' favorite program, but it's a premium program that came with my gear. So why am I going to pay another couple hundred dollars for another premium program when I already have one? Yeah. And so at first, I thought that having that open um, had taken over the microphone. So I undid that and did a test, and no, that wasn't it. And so then I checked to make sure the everything on the preamp was was good, and lo and behold, it wasn't. Of course, it wasn't. So, Why would it so be today good? It won't be the day that I do our first audio recording for a podcast, but that's fine. We'll get there. We'll get there. We should probably just do it sometime where we're just talking to each other. <laughs> I also need. Yeah. I also need to do to test the restream setup using the pixel sharks channel because if i can get that if i if i understand how that works then when i stream to the extra life channel i can restream it to my channel mm, yeah so okay figure why not and you know i could just go over your previous videos and just record straight from twitch say something again can you hear me okay now yeah since i don't have your obs set up i, I can't uh or since I don't have your stream. No, I just, I heard a, I heard a, a, a high pitched sound and I wasn't sure if it was coming when you talked or something else. I'm not sure. I don't know. It just went away. Oh, it could have been, um, I have two timers going right now because my life is off of timers. Yeah. I can't remember crap. I no, have it's my washer. My it's definitely washer. coming from you. I just heard it again. All right. Let me go check to see if my clothes washer is done because that could be it. Oh, and it also could have been. No, it was. Mysterio. It was very. It was very, very low in the background. So, who knows? Oh, jeez! I have so many stupid noises in my house. I'll bet you it's my bathroom fan. It's been getting squeaky lately. Oh, well, maybe. It, Let it, me go it, shut that off. Your, your initial thing straight. sounded right. All right, right back. Ah, I forgot that I'd set up Nightbot a while ago when I was thinking about switching to it. I had all the commands set up in it, and then once I did that, I realized, wait a minute, I can't have a quote system okay, in here. Clothes washer is done and off. Fan is off. So now the only uh, the only noise that I should oh, and my phone is muted. The only noise that I should have coming in is a, a timer at about thirty six minutes. For Lovely. Enchiladas that are going to be done. Lovely. So yeah. happy for you. Uh, I think I turned the video done? games. Let me tell you. I'm adjusting sounds in here because. Ah, yeah. Well, it's not, I, I just, there's there's no music playing. Actually, you know what? I'm going to keep the music down because I don't like, I don't like how the music turns off. Oh, uh, yeah. What I need to do is make... I thought I had a playlist for it, but I was right. So, 
How are you doing? Uh, okay, I guess. Could be better, definitely. Could always be better. Everybody could always be better. Mm -hmm. um, I woke up not feeling so hot. Just... So I don't know whether it's just a matter of... I don't know whether that not feeling so hot is just a matter of um, you know, just normal hormonal fluctuations. Hey, Captain Oz. Hello. Or whether it's... Welcome on in. I don't know. I mean, just lots of stupid, day, you know, normal, very daily stressors. And, and like, you know, one of the problems with uh, having PTSD when it's severe is... Um, normal anxiety is that much harder to deal with. Yes, it is. Um, something that should be small becomes overwhelming. Pretty much everything oh. that should be small becomes overwhelming. Yeah, that's that's no joke. So, why? <sighs> there we go. I want to let me see. I, I, I wish things would just, you know, work the same way. So, it could be a difference of mods. What are you trying to do? No, no. I, this is a no, this has nothing to do with. Ah, there we go. I had to click on. I have the. I'm using the Groove Player Windows to play music that's mixed up from the RimWorld soundtrack and the second one that I found. Ah, yes. And for some reason, I couldn't get it to show me the the pan, the control part where I could actually set it to shuffle and repeat and all that stuff. Because mm. otherwise, it wasn't going to go. So. But yeah, welcome on in, Captain of Oz, and everybody else. I hope everybody had a good weekend. I had a mostly functional weekend. Mostly functional? What does that mean? Um, well, I mean, I got things done, but I just, I don't know. They were just, they were, I feel like I could have made better use of the time. So I did get one really big thing done, so... And then I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to share mine and then you're going to share yours because one of the things, and uh, hi Zoe, one of the things that I think, we, when we talked about this before, celebrating those those successes, mm -hmm. because Sunday morning when I was at my, at my church group, they asked us, think of something that you're thankful for about the week. And I was sitting there thinking about the week mm -hmm. and I had a hard time thinking of something that I was thankful about. So I just chose, I'm glad I made it through the week, which sometimes uh. that's... That's, Sometimes yeah, that's that's, that's what you have to have to say. But then, <laughs> hello, Pixel Sharks. Uh, so I decided that afternoon. I mean, actually, I decided that morning I was going to do it. But I made the point of when I came home, not letting myself nap, just getting straight okay. to getting straight into it. And it's a good thing I did because I'm not sure if I would have finished it. But I finally completed our taxes yesterday. Ooh. I'd had to wait That's for some. Achievement. I'd had to wait for some documents and ended up getting in a, a, a modified W two, which I'm not really sure what they modified because the numbers were still the same. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just went through and did all of the did all of that yesterday, and that took me four and a half hours or so. Dang. Yeah, but so since we've already started talking, oh, but before we go on, what what was your achievement? My achievement for today? Mm-hmm. No, I mean, just uh, what's something that you've achieved that you're proud of lately? Hey, I know one. Uh, Captain Oz, yeah, you have to be careful with them. There's a 20, there's a 20, 90 rule where if you're going to take a nap, do 20 minutes or do 90 minutes. and Because for some reason, those two times don't either don't you don't feel like you got too much sleep inertia but you also feel rested and i picked that up from my from my therapist so if you can't think of one i can think of one for you please because yeah i am not you're, do, you, I you're doing laundry and you took a shower oh see little things Dang. yeah holy crap so you just said you were to you were you were doing laundry so you're actually oh, doing your laundry you yeah. thought and you thought of it without 
without me ever doing the little thing I, I would do in the mornings going, hey, how are you doing? What you going to do for today? So you could start you could start doing that. Yeah, I didn't know that either, Captain Oz. Just something uh, when I was talking, I was discussing the need and how th the stressors were wearing me out to the point that I felt like I needed to rest. My therapist the made the suggestion. RM, REM cycle is about three hours and in multiples of three hours. So I knew things like sleep for three hours, six hours, nine hours. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know that you could go. Oh, and I also knew the 20 minutes. But I didn't know you could do a, a hour and a half. Yeah. But it makes sense. Yeah, 20 minutes, 90 minutes. So when I take my afternoon nap on Sundays, if, I, if I, the morning has been particularly stressful for me, I will set the timer for 90 minutes. I will actually set it for, for about a 105 minutes because I know I'm not going to fall asleep right away. Also, I'll, I'll do a couple of things, and then right when I get to the 90-minute mark, I just close my eyes and lay there. Oh. So, but I didn't do that yesterday because I wanted to get the taxes done. So Okay, so there. Celebrating the little things. How about you, Captain Oz? What's something that you accomplished? Because <laughs> we, we like to celebrate the little things. Uh, yeah, when that's when it feels like that's all you've got, little things are vital. So would you, since you picked the topic today, would you like to share it? Uh, yes. So I can't remember my dreams, but just over the last couple of days... I've been very on edge and it occurred to me that in my new apartment, okay, back up, back up. Let me just top down hypervigilance. And uh, what I mean by hypervigilance isn't necessarily uh, something who's easily startled, but rather you're trying to pay attention so to absolutely no, no, everything. No and it's not something that you do sounds, consciously. Right? It's just Sorry, hold on. I, I forgot that when I triggered that one using using the stream puppy thing that it played that sound with it. <laughs> so there was an annoying sounds thing from min, min, uh, from Despicable Me playing over <laughs> part of your statement oh. there. So I didn't mean to do that. It's okay. So by hypervigilance, I mean that your brain is always trying to pay attention to everything that's going on around you. Every sound, everything that moves, mm -hmm. even um, scents. the idea that your your brain is so so convinced that something terrible is going to happen mm -hmm. that all you can do is be try to be prepared for it yes so you go into every every situation expecting something bad to happen mm -hmm. and trying to prepare yourself for whatever that is and it's it's kind of a catch twenty two because sometimes apart from getting a bit of housework done, not much. Hey, little things, little things. Yeah, See? we're celebrating little things. So good oh, job. Yeah. Like that, it may not be much to a, a normal person, but somebody with you know crippling mental health issues, a little bit of housework is freaking fantastic. Yes, uh, agreed. The. I want, something else I would put on that list for me is I have been pretty much managing getting the groceries and cooking the meals, making sure all the meals are fine. Okay. Um, hang on. I think someone's knocking on my door. I will be right back. So give me just a second. So while he's checking that, uh, I can't tell if he muted or not, but I'll keep talking in case he didn't mute. Uh, well, he's checking that. Um, yeah, but the hypervigilance is part of the reason why I have a hard time going out doing anything. Um, not muted. Fantastic. Thank you, Captain Oz. Um, so I'm going to try not to say anything that he might want to comment on. Okay, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Okay. So I was just going to um, keep everybody entertained while you were... Yeah, I didn't that. mute you. But I... But no, I... Okay. I switched to the Oh, I think I know what it is. I think somebody upstairs is work they they've been having some work done upstairs. So oh. So one of the changes so here's something else I accomplished over the weekend. 
I set up OBS Studio back up to where I could just use this. I still haven't set up the extra life stuff in it, but I made a lot of progress with it. And one of the things that I decided to do this time is instead of me constantly switching scenes and then having all the different sources in there, uh -huh. I have all the scenes set up the way I want them, but the main the main scene just links to scenes. Okay. So when I if I want to walk away, I can just hit the a single scene like this, both of the scenes are still active. So you can still see you, you, the game, the, the scene that has the game on it is still visible behind it because Be Right Back is in front of it. Yeah. And it's, I'm, I'm liking this so far. And if I make a, if I make a single change to a scene in, you know, on another one, then it doesn't, it doesn't affect, it'll, it'll actually appear on this one, but I won't have to, it's just a different way of managing it and I like it. So that was something yeah. else I did this weekend. It sounds uh, you've been having so much trouble with Streamlabs OBS, but I'm very happy that that is now. Uh, yeah, fr Friday during the extra live stream, all of my hotkeys were working exactly the way they were supposed to. So I'm playing level head, just going on, and this is just one of those little things that really ticks me off. And is it all, and I have another one that I can share that just happened yesterday, went in today. Switching to switching to OBS Studio versus um, slobs. Yes, I've noticed. I'm not dropping any frames, whereas before, and the CPU usage is at nine percent. Whereas with Streamlabs, I'm usually sitting at fifteen to twenty percent just for it. Oh, that's a huge difference. Yeah, and the and I'm not and we're playing a multiplayer game. And granted, he's hosting it, but it's not really stressing. I'm not really feeling it, and I'm running Nightbot in a browser at the same time, which is usually something I don't do. Mm. So not, uh, I'm, I always enjoyed, uh, OBS studio. I used it and you know, after what was that first one you mentioned all the time, the other streaming oh, X -Split. X -Split. X split. I started with X split back in 2012. And I think in 2013 or 14, I switched to OBS studio, OBS and then OBS studio. And I never went back. They changed something in XSplit at the time, and I don't know if it's still there, but it just, it created massive problems. You used to be able to control games that, you know, either using Broadcaster or Gamecaster, because, you know, it was fairly cheap to get both of them together. You could uh, deal with games regardless of what their, mm -hmm. uh, their resolution was, whether it was windowed, whether it was windowed full screen. But something happened and it just started becoming really cumbersome and hard to deal with. And I think that's when we switched. Okay. So anyway, back to the topic. Hypervigilance. Yeah, it, yeah str slobs is just such a, a such a hog. I also want to experiment with OBS Live. What I may end up doing is doing my Friday streams on OBS Live and then my streams to my channel on OBS Studio. We'll just have to wait and see how that goes. So. Uh, slobs on a laptop. Ooh, that oh, sounds miserable. Miserable. <laughs> Just miserable. It's uh, such it's such a resource hog. <clears throat> so and it's because so, they keep yeah. trying to cram more and more into it. So but so anyway, the, the hypervigilance. Go ahead. Um Oh my gosh. Everything. Just everything gets Uh oh. What happened? Desynced? Yep. Immediately, yeah. <laughs> I guess we're not gonna do this one. So I mean, there must be a there must be something with the, with it's simulating. Okay, I'm yeah. back. So you unpause it and we'll see what happens. All right, let's see if you immediately do sync again. It looks like yep. you did immediately do yep. sync again. So it must be oh. something with the mods. Yep. We we said we would try it, and if there was any glitches, we would just drop it. So that's that's what we're gonna do. Ah, yeah, but let's uh, let's just I'll load up our smaller map. Of oh, I do not have the compatibility. It didn't give you the same list as I have. For example, I don't have the compatibility mod. I think actually I may have the wrong list. You, I'm pretty sure you do because I. I'm looking at your list. Hold on. Oh, octone, better spikes, camera plus, ceiling light. Color coded move by the only difference I think is multiplayer compatibility. You may not have that one in yours. I do not. I dropped it because uh, I kept 
all of the um, animals logic was the only reason we were using it and we were having so much trouble with that anyway i would that still i would leave it in there just in case well i would rather not troubleshoot while we're streaming yeah but if it's one thing i'm here how about this i'll 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 remove it i was going to refresh my game but that's okay because it's so quick to do yeah okay so anyway back to hypervigilance um so everything everything going on around um i was saying that the last few days i've been thinking about hypervigilance uh, a lot because my new apartment is facing the parking lot and so i keep all of my blinds closed but that means that as things are happening, you know, I can hear people pulling in and out. I can hear work going on. I can see headlights at night coming to the windows. I see people walking in front of headlights. So all these sounds, the shadows, the changing light, all of this stuff. Um, but I can't see it because the blinds are closed. Like I, 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 my brain recognizes that there's things going on, but not being able to see it changes everything. Oh yeah, that you do seem to be in right away. I think you, I think it's a matter of you needing to add it. Okay, I would rather not. I don't know how. Do you have it? You want to do this? Well, I don't mind I it. Do I just want to. I do not want to troubleshoot something that we know troubleshooting gets super complicated, and no matter what we try, it always seems to have issues. So I'd rather not start in that direction. While we're how, how about I propose a much simpler solution? We just remove all the mods. So all we have is multiplayer. And just play straight vanilla. Just play straight vanilla. Yeah. If it if it desyncs once, we'll, we'll quit. Line. We'll quit. All right. So yep, that's the right one. And do you want to? Do you, I don't know if you're gonna need. Yeah. So we'll just do core multiplayer. Thanks. We'll see you later. Thanks for joining. Bye, Captain Oz. So while that loads, so yeah, uh, yeah, the the change in the environment here too, it it required adjusting to the new sounds <laughs> because there's going to be sounds wherever you go. It just some of it's good. Some of, for us, some of it's it, it's good because we have less of certain sounds. Uh, do we need hugs, Lib? Nope. We have to have hugs, though, right? Nope. Even with the multiplayer? Mm, yep, multiplayer is good by itself. Right. Hugslib just provides some dependency libraries for other mods, but not multiplayer. So you let me know when you're ready. So, so yeah, it did require some adjustment. The The fact that we now have a car, a park covered parking outside our windows that have lights on 24-7. <laughs> So there's always light coming in our windows. And I kind of don't like how on display our bedroom window is to the rest of the to the parking lot. But that's just a matter of just remembering, hey, we actually have a walk-in bathroom with a walk-in closet inside there. So we can just go in there and get dressed. <clears throat> yeah. So. so is there anything else on that, the... the Know, how it, how it's been affecting you at home? I mean, that's what's been that's what I realized has been the the first and primary impact, but it's not it's not um like the only thing or the worst thing or anything like that. It's just just what's been what's been uh, what was on your mind. What's been getting me thinking about it? Yeah. Well, and when you—that's that, just the stuff that's at home. It's my it, it, think about what it's like when you go outside, <laughs> and all the factors that you can't control. You, until yeah, you, the... until you're aware of it, there are so many things that go on around you that you just you just don't realize is happening. You don't realize how much sensory input you're dealing with. How many, no. how many factors are contributing to the stress that you're experiencing until you're made aware of it? So if you're someone who has a sensory processing disorder, 
like everyone in our family. It's kind of, it goes, it's comorbid with ADHD. You are just much more aware of all of those little distracting sounds that are always around that people, other people just can ignore, could tune out. Like right now, my daughter, who's supposed to be staying in her bedroom, keeps coming out and making noise. And she does this all day long. I was that the instructions were simple. Stay in your room. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting here trying to do a job like my, my part-time job is requires listening. If it's a steady sound, like the sound of the TV at a steady volume, I can deal with it. But the random sounds that people make when they're just existing, they're just being here. It's their home. They're doing things. They're so haphazard and random that anytime they happen, it just derails me. I can't focus past it. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, and that's just at home. Then we go outside and everywhere you go, it's just nonstop. There's sounds, there's people, there's smells, there's all kinds of things that you're not, it's not what you're used to. And so it all, it all hits you all at the same time. And your brain is just trying to yes. keep track of it all. And when you're already hyper well you're already aware of everything that's going on you because you're for some reason just all of that input sets you on edge then when you become when you experience something that puts you to the hyper vigilant state all of those sounds that would normally just say oh i'm just on edge from it become magnified yeah it's it becomes a massive just everything everything else stops everything else is just everything is is controlled by it Mm mm-hmm yeah, it, and it's it, it's something that's almost impossible to ignore. <laughs> spawning, spawning. Okay, so now we'll see. I'm here. You can go ahead and unpause it, and let's see how it goes. Yeah. There we go. We shall see. But. For, for me, one of the things that really bugs me is when things, for for just no apparent reason at all, no obvious reason, it, it's not like you can track it to a specific cause, just stop working. So for me, yesterday afternoon, when we got back from lunch, back from church, we sat down, Art and I sat down for lunch, Zoe didn't want to join us, so we decided to watch, we're watching, making our way through season 12 of Big Bang Theory. We watched a couple of episodes, like two I think. And yeah. Art actually fell asleep during the last one. Hey, Jin Ving. Are you there? I can see you. Nice to see howdy. you. Howdy, howdy, howdy. So the first two episodes, I'm not going to talk spoilers. So the first two episodes we, we watched, Art went fine. Art fell asleep. So she came back later and rewatched that episode. And then they, they just, you know, she just rewatched the episode and realized she hadn't actually missed that much. So then she went on her merry way watching something on Hulu or I think actually directly on you know, it's a channel from Amazon that she she just subscribed to for free so she yeah. could watch movies on there. I can't remember. I think it was the Hallmark thing. And it all worked fine. But then later that evening, when we finally sat down again to watch one more episode, uh, well, I do try to make sure that I keep the voice at a, at a set level all the way through so that it can be relaxing. I don't want it to be... I don't want it to be... A source of... Unsafe. Anxiety. Exactly. So, when we sat down that evening to watch the next episode, it wouldn't play. But when I would play, when I went back to play the episode before that and the one before that, they played perfectly fine. But anything going forward wouldn't play. When I came over to the computer, I couldn't get it to play through Plex on here. And at first, I restarted the restarted the thing, and then it played fine over here. But when I went back over there, it still wouldn't play it. So I we just give up. Reset it, reset the. Let me sh- shut the the PlayStation off. So we, because we do that with the hardware connection for Plex. Uh-huh. And then I went to bed. When I got up in the morning, uh, we got started, and I asked Zoe if she wanted to start the day with a little a bit of Animaniacs, because I'm showing that to her. And it would not connect. Nothing had changed. The, the the router was exactly the same. All of the settings on the computer were the same. All the settings on the PlayStation were the same. Were the same. It just would not connect. I restarted that's, that's it. I restarted. So I restarted all of the stuff. I went in to check the settings to make sure they were the same. I double checked everything. 
and it was all exactly the same as it was the previous week. And nothing would work. And when it did finally work, I couldn't figure out why. And then it was just connecting to it like it wasn't connected on the same network. Like, mm. It's plugged into the same router. I, d- I just... So I, there's no reason it should be doing this. No, no reason. Well, I mean, there, is, there is reason. It's just it, knowing that, what it is, figuring out what it is. It yeah. Is. Especially when no changes were made. This happened with our, our Amazon Echoes, too. The For some reason, last week... They just disconnected from the internet. Ah, uh, that's a good one. I like that one. The, the for some reason, all of the echoes simultaneously disconnected from the internet. So when we got up, I, I got up. I didn't notice it at first, but when Zoe woke up, she tried to ask it to play some music, and it said it's not connected to the internet. So she came out and let me know. I looked, and sure enough, they were all off the network. Oh, no explanation why they just disconnected from the Wi-Fi. So I reconnected them. All of them were working fine. Two days later, I found I realized. Wait a minute. They're out of the home zones. No, all of the all of the reminders had shut off. They weren't playing anymore. So I went in and looked at the devices because some of them have the same ones. Some of them have different ones. All of them were wiped out. So when I I contacted Amazon to ask, what the heck, they said. Your your devices were reset to fact factory defaults, and I asked them when they did that, and they gave me this time, and I said, "You mean the moment I reconnected them to Wi-Fi, they just automatically reset?" reset. Their... And they said, "Yeah, apparently you did something wrong." I was like, "No, this, these are the steps I did exactly, and I know because I had to do it three times in a row. I followed the setup." in your app they had no answer and I eventually had the and the first level person I was talking to just refused to say oh there's there's no there's no solution so I asked to speak to a supervisor and they kept saying supervisor's not gonna be able to help you <laughs> turns out the supervisor was as baffled as I was and the supervisor said yeah we can send this over <laughs> I'm not even sure why the person said that but it's no reason just no reason uh, for them to do that the levels of communication uh, vary so much, I think, you know, from one step to the next step to the next step. So the people who designed the software originally, people who designed the, the safety protocols, people who designed I mean, yeah. the safety security protocols, people who designed the patch, you know, besides the fact that they may all be different people, the information that they were able to yeah. Get down to everybody else. That I understand. What I don't understand is how two people working in the same customer service department don't don't realize that you can actually send things to tech support. <laughs> Which is why I asked to speak to the supervisor because I knew they could do that. So, yeah. But yeah, as far as I can tell, no reason. The devices just for some re- decided they and, and even if there was a momentary uh, loss of internet connect- connectivity because I think that's what happened the router for some reason just briefly lost connection to the to the internet oh. I sent, the Wi-Fi network came right back up so okay I have to reconnect them why does reconnecting them to the internet trigger a factory reset yeah I, I just, it just dumb. made no, it absolutely made no sense So, yeah, so the, that did, and I can't, I have such a hard time dealing with that. And yeah, you're right, it can be educated. It can be that they're uneducated, Some, but some people willfully choose to be uneducated. They learn just enough to get through a job. And when I'm having, I use that device to help me get through the day, to remind me to do things. And now I have to go back through and put all of those things in there. And now the day-to-day ones, I know what they are. They're quick and easy to add back in. But I was also adding in some important reminders, such as remember to order medicine on this day. Well, the problem is I don't remember what day that was supposed to be. So now that's gone. And when I asked if they backed that up to this to the cloud, like they do everything else, they said no, that feature isn't included because it's different from device to device. You you already save information that's device to device. I already know that you do that. Why isn't this in the supervisor? I don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to ask. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Um, today, Jin, uh, I'm not sure if you read the title, but the title is we're talking about hypervigilance and some of the what, what triggers that for us. And so small stressors that you don't realize, like the fact that the, that the, well, I'll have Charles Mike say in a second, like the fact that someone who was given a very simple instruction keeps not doing it. I mean, I don't understand what's so, what's so hard about stay in your room. <laughs> anyway, uh, hypervigilance, would you like to, to give her the definition? Hypervigilance. It Saving. Means that your brain is constantly, always trying to pay attention and track everything that goes on around you. All the sounds, all of the movements, You're... all of, I mean, even all of the smells, just everything that happens around you, your brain wants to know everything. Yes, hyper hyper awareness, hypersensitive, exactly to the point of overload. So uh, that's one of the reasons why people with post traumatic stress disorder or uh, other related anxiety disorders have trouble with crowds. Um, it's why they have trouble driving, oftentimes mm -hmm. because there's it, it's like. If, if, if there's so much happening that you can't pay attention to, that triggers all the anxiety, all of the... Interesting, so smells, that's a... Well, I would say, because I, I mentioned this earlier, there are other factors that can contribute to this. I have yeah. ADHD, and ADHD is often, ha often has comorbidity with sensory processing. It's you can have a sensory processing disorder and not have ADHD, but if you have ADHD, odds are you have some symptoms of sensory process, sensory processing disorder, meaning you have a hard time processing all of the input. We had to my, for my daughter to help her manage it. We had to put her in therapy that essentially overwhelmed her, overwhelmed her with sensory input while she was trying to do things so that she her brain could process it. And this meant for therapy, she went to somewhere. To, to a place where she played for an hour and while she played the therapist was intentionally grabbing hold of her arm or shaking her arm or tapping her with a feather or bumping her or uh, things like that or putting her into something that overloaded her sensory things like a ball pit <laughs> uh, water is another thing it's, if you ever wonder why kids get so hyperactive after they've been in a bath it's so much sensory input that it stimulates them and gets them excited. My dog is exactly the same way. Every time he comes out of the bath, as soon as he's free to go, he just bolts back and forth around the house. Just absolutely haywire bonkers because it was such a fun experience for him and now he's got all this energy that he's got to get out. So <laughs> you can have sensitivity to sensory input and not have, not have experienced trauma. In this case, what we're talking about is so... You already have some form of sensitivity to the sensory input. This magnifies that to a whole nother level to the point that you are constantly on edge, frightened for your, you, know, you feel unsafe. And so you become even more aware of all of the same stuff. And it's just this bad, this cycle that feeds back on itself. Uh, which is oftentimes things that are happening that you don't know about so that if there's so much happening and you can't pay attention, that can trigger feelings of I'm, I'm in danger. Mm -hmm. Because if your brain thinks that your environment is dangerous, but you see everything that's happening is safe, then you don't feel like you're in danger. But if there's things that you can't see or things that you're expecting to happen that you can't see ahead of time or hear ahead of time, then that that danger trigger hits and it becomes overwhelming. Um, uh, so with, with fire, for example, if there was trauma in the past, your brain could recognize and associate mm -hmm. those smells and those expectations of, hey, there's going to be fire. And as soon as your brain recognizes that it's there, it triggers that, that danger. And, 
And as a child, having something burning right in front of your house, which is supposed to be your safe place, that could very much be a traumatic experience. And, so, yeah, so even if you wouldn't have, even if you didn't have PTSD, that could now be a danger uh, sense to you. You know, the smell of fire or the something that your brain recognizes as, as associated with that. So for me, it's. So, I, I don't know how much of it was directly combat and how much of it was well combat's the only thing that I can really think of but any you know the, the idea of it doesn't matter you know when I was in Afghanistan it didn't matter where I was it didn't matter if I was eating eating it didn't matter if I was going to the bathroom it didn't matter if we were out on a mission oh hang on I need to go pull a gelato out of the oven and I will be right back for me, what in the sense of what he's talking about, I, I didn't experience that any kind of combat trauma because I was never deployed into that kind of environment. For me, it was a, it was a, res, it was a result of ongoing exposure to traumatic images and events and the overwhelming feelings that came with it because of the role that I played in those events and that led me to having a nervous breakdown as I was trying to get out while the Air Force was fighting me to the nail to keep me in and that just made it worse so I ended up feeling trapped in a, in a job that I knew I didn't want to do that I knew was bad for me and no one would listen so as a result I became really hyper aware to, and hyper defensive of everything because it felt like everybody at work whether they were or they weren't was actively trying to keep me trapped in a job that I didn't want to be in anymore doing stuff that I that, that as long as I was there taking part in it was it was injuring me in a way that I didn't fully understand now I do I, I don't know if I put this one this command in there oh yes I did I, know, I, had, I didn't understand the term for it at the time. Uh, I came across it later when my wife ex shared it with me. And it's the subject of moral injury, which if you would like to understand what that is, you can you can look up. That's a, some scientists and experts in the field at Syracuse University, their definition of it. I didn't understand that at the time. I didn't know what was happening. I just knew that I needed to get out of that and everyone was taking so long to do their jobs or just not doing them and combine that with my leadership actively trying to sabotage what what career I did have left I I mean I, I already said it I had a, I had a mental breakdown I was actually going through therapy for a different type of a different bit of trauma from before in my childhood and the barriers because of that therapy were so broken down that when I started to panic at work, it got it was it was multiplied, it was magnified. So we actually had to stop doing that, and we focused on teaching me coping skills for the anxiety <laughs> because I didn't have a way to get away from it. So two different experiences resulting in a similar, you know, injury up here and elsewhere that I, I, he I'd been talking to Chellis Mike for a couple of years post his traumatic experience as he separated before I did and and some of it was compounded as time went on after that so I was aware of what was happening with him but I did not truly understand what he was referring to until after 2016 early 2017 and even then when I thought I'd kind of gotten a handle on it I had a relapse last year late last year because of just so much stress of being away from family away from my support system that I, I wasn't able to handle it all and so people who knew me here suddenly I, they couldn't talk to me because I would panic and that that kind of touches back into the hypervigilant side of it. These were people that I knew that I, I had a familiarity with in an environment that I was familiar in. But 
I had a hard time suddenly with all of the noise in the room. There was just so much noise that I, it would wear me down to the point that I just would curl in on myself and I just wouldn't interact with anybody. If I did have the thought to say something, just the, just the thought of everybody looking at me would send my heart racing. And I was constantly trying to figure out where the exit was. Sorry being, about that no, you're fine. But being, being out in the public area of of the church was another one where it, it saves. That's why I paused mm. where I'm just trying to walk across the commons area and people are, there's so much noise coming in and people, and there's smells too, but there's, uh, there's a coffee shop. People bring cookies. People have kids with diapers. <laughs> you know, there's whatever smell the state decides, you know, the, the environment outside decides to subject us to. And then there's the randomness of everybody coming from every direction and not really being aware of themselves. People would bump into me and I mean, it got to the point where I was just walking along the walls trying to avoid anybody even seeing me. Or I would sneak in through a back door to get just to get to the classroom. Um, and I wasn't I wouldn't go to the service at all. If I went, I would just go to the to the to the meet the class meeting because it was a it was a, there was a straight line from a back door to the to that room and then a straight line back out. And so then all I had to deal with was the people in that classroom. Now, going to the store was impossible. Uh, the, the the store that I do most of my grocery shopping at is Kroger. That store, you think, oh, it's just a grocery store. But that store had a radio station that it was playing constantly. And it was always really loud. And then if they came on the PA to give any kind of announcement, they were twice as loud as the music. So if the music was already loud, mm. and it is very real. You are very, very, very right. There's a lot. What you'll find as we talk about this, there's a lot of comorbidity with other uh, mental difficulties that people will face. Uh, so when we talk about our experiences, if you find something like that that's similar, it, um, for one thing, it helps you, we, we hope, realize you're not alone. That it's not, it's not that, it's not, we're not saying that there's not something wrong with you, but hey, there's, there is, and it's okay. Ooh. Oh, yeah. I'd say everybody has their fair share of mental junk <laughs> up there. So, uh, yeah, in the store, in the in the Kroger, every hour they do a, a a zone refresh, which means they come on and they play a bit of music even louder than the radio, and then when the announcer comes on, he's even louder than that song. I, one time I went, I tried to go in. This was in March, late, or February. Well, I hope you I hope you find a place where you can talk about that, Jen. Uh, pr- preferably with a professional. Yeah, that's always you know we talk about having friends and family, and I, I would consider this a friends side, but friends and family can only do so much. Uh, mm-hmm. Professionals have the tools to. They can't tell us how to fix something, but they can help us learn to cope with ourselves. We have a turtle deteriorating. Yeah. I Okay. Um, I, I can talk about with the row. It's more how to how to get it out more to the, out to the non pros. That 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 can be challenging figuring out when and where. And I would I would say you might want to look up this book. I'll post it in the chat. Uh, big, understanding who how you can figure out who your safe people are is oh, yeah. is critical to you. It's, I'd say it's critical to your recovery because some people without even understanding why will make sure. will not be safe because of just the comments that they make and it's not that they're trying to be mean it's no, they just don't know they're it. just oblivious yeah. my mother-in-law is one of those people she's not she's not she's not on my safe list my mother <laughs> is not on my safe list actually most of my family isn't yeah ignorant some of them just aren't aware. The yep. my my in laws, for example. Now, my mother in law, she's she, she has her own challenges too, which make it harder for her to be aware of such things. I would say that that's actually the most likely place to find people that are not safe to talk to is somebody who's lived with their own problems for so long and developed their own unhealthy coping mechanisms that their brain thinks that you should cope with your problems the same ways that they've learned to cope with theirs. In a lot of cases, that's 
pretend like it's not there. Yeah, and well, I, I can tell you that it, I know it was an adjustment for my wife and daughter figuring out how to live with me and some of the things that we've shared on this channel about, you know, how do you live with someone who has, how can you be a, a safe person for some, with someone you live with who has something like PTSD? Yeah. Without my wife's interest, because she's pursuing a, a college degree, a license in professional counseling, some of the, a lot of this stuff I wouldn't, I wouldn't know and probably not, would not have encountered initially without a, another professional saying it. So I had that advantage. But for people that have, that grew, like, say, grew up with you, with who, who knew you in one way, for, them, for some of them, it is very hard for them to, to understand that you're different. My father in law is a counter example. He actually talked to my wife before they came and while he was here to find out what he could do to help. And it's good that you, that you felt very safe with your partner. It's that is having someone like that that you can rely on is is critical to recovery, whether it be a partner, a life partner, a family member, or a professional, but or a best friend. Yeah, and that's that was another. I was actually going to mention that, and Charles, Mike, you can comment on this. When there's clearly something wrong with you, and people come to try to help. I have a very specific example that I was, that I started on earlier, but I, I don't remember what distracted me about the time I went to Kroger in February. Do you have one you want to share first, Chelsea, Mike? Because I've been talking for a while. Um, oh, I undid. So I undid those. Oh, okay. From intentionally. Okay. Just Basically making sure. No space over there. That's good. Stuff. If you need to um, think, if you need to think about it for a second, I can share mine. Well, I just tend to interact. I, I'm one of two ways. I'm either open. Actually, no. There, there are things that I don't talk about with people. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, I use all my other problems as an excuse. So if somebody asks me how I'm doing or what I'm thinking of or, or feeling. Um, they get the one that I am open about. They don't get the stuff that I don't talk about. Um, it's almost like I hide some things under other things. <clears throat> For example, with the PTSD, people know that I was in Afghanistan. People know that I got shot at. People don't necessarily know what I did for the military. And so if they're talking about, you know, if, I, if I'm obviously having problems, I don't necessarily tell them that, hey, it was this killing people part, not getting shot at part. Mm -hmm. uh, because not everybody knows what we did, and it's not something that I talk about, it's not something that we really can talk about. So it, it's easy to hide some of the, the moral injury feelings um, under the, the PTSD. Well, and sent... I've said it before. Now I'm getting closer, but I would rather talk about the PTSD side of it than go anywhere near the moral injury side of it. No, that's a, that's obscenely hard to talk about because you have to talk about what you did, what you experienced, and I frankly am not ready to talk about it yet. No, yeah, you have to admit, like, moral injury is is like rapists facing that they're rapists, murderers facing that they're murderers. If people who have, I know one that I expect is fairly common is people with kleptomania probably have a hard time processing or acknowledging or dealing with what they do um, and why they do it, you know? I, I, that's just a. I just shared a book in the chat. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. And it's a description, the, the opening part of it is a description of a person who was in. The concentration camps in Germany but was not a very well known was a kind of he wanted to tell the story of people who were there that haven't whose story hasn't already been told and he talks a lot about the things that they were willing to do to survive yeah 
yeah. and it is everywhere as I'm going through that the way he's talking about it it's everywhere in there the the realizing at some point my goodness what have I done mm-hmm. and that's <laughs> when he said that I was thinking yeah I, I yeah just yeah well thanks for joining us Jen yes thanks go get some sleep glad to see you came over I, I actually saw her in Imperial Jedi's channel yesterday Oh, cool. Okay. So, and he did a nice, friendly little shout out for me, and that's why she came over. So, I hope you get some rest. We do this on Mondays when we talk about this, so you can count on that. Once, once a week on Mondays, we'll we'll be talking about something like this. And I hope you do well in nursing school. Oh, heck yeah! Yes, you will. When I went through my training to be a chaplain's assistant slash religious affairs, one of the things that they went talked in a ad nauseum about was the need to prepare ourselves for the unforeseeable yep and you're always welcome to come in and and share absolutely so we this is a safe space we do that we say that on purpose so that people can feel and and realize that they're not going to be spooked (laughs) when they're here so but yes i hope you get a good night's rest jen and good luck with your studies Which is which can also be a challenge if you're facing if you're trying to face it with some kind of a, a, a mental baggage. I guess would be the, oh, best, yeah. the best way to put it. <clears throat> uh, but to share, I'll go ahead and share the one I was talking about. I tried to go to Kroger with with Groot and Zoe, and it was very early on in Groot's training. But he was still very hyper hyper since hyperactive and in, in when other people were around and it just we made it as we made it in we went in one entrance that was closer to the freezer section and we made it into the freezer section we were i was aiming to get to the back where there was less people so then i could get to the rows i needed to get the items we needed and get out and this was before i discovered you can do pickup and delivery yeah and i he just was so hyperactive that it was trying to keep control of him was just overwhelming me and I ended up on the floor, leaning against the freezer section, clinging desperately to his his leash to keep him where I was. And my daughter leaning over me, trying to to kind of shield me from everybody else. And of course, some people were looking, some people were just r- running away. But then one person decided to come up and help. And I don't remember who she was. I just remember that she was a nurse trying to help. And while I appreciated it, it was, she was... She was insisting on helping, even though at that moment, I didn't want the help. Yeah. And it didn't mean I didn't need the help. It just meant that at that moment, what I needed was her to leave me alone. I needed I needed the, some of the input to stop. And I eventually managed to get on my feet and just r- run back out to the car and put Groot in there. And Zoe was waiting for me inside when I came back in, and she had to perform. She had to do that. But I... I still, I'm not really sure what happened. I just know I suddenly got overwhelmed to the point that I was curled up in a ball on the floor, clinging to a hyperactive dog with a a 12-year-old standing there doing her best to shield me from people and communicate to people who did come closer. That's that's embarrassing. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason why we have so much stigma where people don't like talking about it because we feel so embarrassed about the realities that we live in, you know? Yeah. Most people don't think about how hard it is to go to the store. It's not. I mean, the most difficult thing they're going to face is traffic on the way and parking. You know, it may be a cart that's, whose wheel doesn't work right, but I'm going to face all of those too. Traffic is constantly keeping me hypersensitive as I drive. You know, parking somewhere where I can get in the store without having to encounter too many people, getting in the store and then getting to where the stuff is that I need while there's music blasting and PA people talking and people coming, just appearing out around a corner. I'm just making my way slowly down an aisle and someone who's in a hurry will just blast right by me as I'm coming to the edge of the aisle. They can see my cart peeking out and they still just blast right by like a car that's that you just didn't see coming. That just decided they were going to go whether or not it was your turn or not. Oh. And... That that instant, so all of that, all of those factors overwhelming me, 
So I'm really sensitive to what's going on. And then all of a sudden someone just appears out of nowhere and that's it. I'm done. I'm triggered and I, and I can't think of what I need to do next, but get away. Yeah. And generally my response is, is while I, I feel the need to flee, I never do. I'm more likely to freeze. If I don't, if I don't, if I don't have a safe escape route that I knew I, I that I know I can do, without, you know, potentially exposing myself to other factor, other other, you know, dangers, I won't, I won't, I won't run. I'll just freeze. Oh. <clears throat> so, um, it's rough. I tend to not freeze ever. Running is. It's just a given. It's like a guarantee. Anything, anything will trigger me to run. Well, it, it's possible. I mean, if you think about it, it's possible that that's a result of how we got our, how we, how our trauma was imposed on us. Yeah. You were in an environment where if you froze, that was bad. You needed to run. Yeah. I wasn't in an environment and, like that. We were, you know, if you were out and about. Like if you were walking around base and you started getting shot at, the first thing you would do is get to cover. Mm -hmm. um, if we were out on mission, you know, sometimes, for example, uh, some of the missions we would do would be, you know, provide security for for uh, some engineers to repair a road or provide security for a convoy or something. M most of them weren't the convoy type. The convoy types, you <clears throat> you don't move when you get attacked. But anything else, whether it was a patrol, whether it was, you know, providing security for somebody, the first thing you do when you start, you know, when a, when a firefight starts is you move yeah. to, you know, if you're in vehicles, if you're not in vehicles, then the, the take cover part is, is still there. But yeah, so the, you know, the vast majority of times you get in a firefight, the, the first thing that you're doing is, is moving. You're running to a safe place. You know, it doesn't matter what else is going on. You're saving. Well, I say that, but one of my jobs was to run out in the middle of fire and take down our equipment. So yeah. running away wasn't really applicable. Doesn't necessarily make sense. <clears throat> but yeah, so run away, hide. Get away, get away, get away, hide. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, it was... It, it could be very, very frustrating. Whereas trauma that has a background in somebody in a position of power um, abusing, you know, sometimes you, they, they have prevented any ability to run away. And so freezing is the only option. So it, yeah, it's also kind of circumstantial on how things were initiated, how things were triggered, how things were uh, first presented, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You okay? It's a, it's a, I mean, it's, a... it's always it's always triggering to talk about and work through and process this kind of stuff, of course. But, okay, yeah, I'm okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> I mean, take a moment to to breathe. Take a moment to uh, kind of just process the emotions. Exactly, which can be difficult in and of itself. Yeah. I, for the long time, I didn't. I had a very hard time processing the emotions. It's part of why I went on that other medicine was because I was having a very hard time processing emotions. But the flip side to that was I couldn't I couldn't function in other ways. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the thing is like it's it becomes so easy almost ne necessary to run away from the emotions. Mhm. Mm then when you start recognizing that they're still there that running away from them avoiding them doesn't actually help anything um you can start feeling you can start thinking about uh for me that means um 
for me that means taking a moment, just breathing, and try to, to stop the line of thought that's going on and step back and be like, okay, what made me feel that way? And then think about it. Yeah. I, I still remember the time when I was in Alabama for training when I was watching a movie that I knew the result of. And mm. even though I knew what was coming and I knew uh, there was no mystery to me. In fact, I was thinking about how much I, I preferred the book ending because I'd read the book first. And I thought that it, that what the changes that they made in the movie, while I understood why they did them, basically rendered one character completely useless. He had mm. no, he had literally no role in the story. They could have completely taken him out at that point and all they would have lost was the one love story that they kind of sort of hinted at and that was it but it didn't even really play a role in what was happening yeah so by changing the story the way they did they took him out and they also took away what was in my opinion a much more interesting a much more difficult rescue of the astronaut (laughs) so that's okay I understood why they chose to do it. It's because that the main character, the character that did perform the rescue is a bigger name, a bigger face. Mm-hmm. And so they, I guess they felt they needed to give that character the big moment. As opposed, as opposed to letting Bucky from Captain America have that moment. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Bucky. Always playing second fiddle. <laughs> I'm going to test some. I think so. You say in playing, uh, or Bucky always playing second fiddle. That reminded me of. Hold on. There's an alert playing. I wanted to see if the alert would work. Hey, the alerts are back. I started the stream saying there were two things we don't have alerts and we don't have the bot, and since then I've managed to get them both in. Okay. (laughs) That worked. Okay, so I also talked about, so we've talked about the hypervigilance, how it, what, what triggers it for us, and what it's like experiencing it. Did we, I kind of talked about it, the whole freezing, and the overwhelming sensation, like too much, too much sensory input. So I guess we kind of talked about all of it. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely still go on about it. Um, I feel free. I'll, I'll just, I'll just comment as you go. So driving for me is one that's really tough um, mm-hmm. i've gotten better at with with therapy you know most most of everything that I've, I've i struggle with i've gotten better at with therapy not everything but a lot of things and driving is definitely one of them so when i'm driving it's not only the the passive ptsd brain that recognizes that there's you know things are dangerous but it's also reality, the rational brain. You know, it, it's a, if something goes wrong, if you miss something, you're going to die. So it's, it's, everything is telling me, be careful. Everything yeah. is telling me, this is incredibly important right now. You can't stop. You can't ignore this. Um, so when they when traffic gets heavy or if it's raining, or if people are trying to talk to me, just the more the more stuff starts happening, the more my anxiety level starts to skyrocket. Did you build this bridge down here? I did not. We're on a, a dirt path through our, our zone. Oh, okay. Okay. So go ahead. The more the more stuff that starts happening, I think is where you left yeah. off. Yeah, so the more stuff that starts happening, the, um, sorry, overwhelmed for a second, so I just need to back up. Case in point, it can be very hard to focus. I, I mentioned it earlier with all the things that are happening at home. I have a very hard time focusing now. If I'm doing the, the part-time job that I do, it's a little easier to focus, except for those random noises that people just being around make when they're just trying, you know, they're doing things. They're not, they're not being noisy. 
but it's really hard to be real, you know, absolutely quiet when you're doing things around the house. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh I got a raid. It's me, the Wonk, is raiding. Oh, no. You're here to steal Thanks. our cheese. Welcome on in. Let me switch over. I'm Guthron. Thanks for coming on in. It's me, the Wonk. I appreciate that. What was you, what were you uh, streaming today? Oh, well, thank you. What were you? Were you doing some more RimWorld? Let's find out. Ah, of course it doesn't work. But I got to fix there. I got to fix all that stuff. Uh, well, thank you. I'm going to del delete that message. I tried to do a shout out for you. You're doing WWE tonight. Nice. Oh, wow. Lots of, what, like a game or were you watching it? So, but yes, I'm Guthron. I am a, a extra live streamer, as you can see up there. And I'm a veteran and we talk about things that veterans face, particularly those with, P particularly those with PTSD. And today we're talking about hypervigilance and what it feels like, what it triggers. And Chalice Mike was just talking about when things get too much and had a moment where things got too much. Your own fictional universe and we watch the AI play matches. That's that's fun. So you have in your channel, you have people uh, just commenting, making comments like they would if you were watching it in person. That's that's hilarious. I'm sure that can be quite entertaining. Nice. So so the AI is just so it's just AI matches. Cool. That's that's a, that's an interesting way to to, to put that uh, game like that onto and make it really interactive with your chat. Oh, <laughs> traders. So, uh, but yeah, thanks. Welcome on in everybody. I tried to give you know it's me the Wonka shout out, but my bot is still still getting it's still confused. We're working on it. I'm getting I'm moving away from Streamlabs. So slowly but surely. So yeah, I stream Mondays two to four and when, when we talk about PTSD and veteran issues Wednesday evenings I'm playing level head every Wednesday evenings at six central and then on Fridays I actually stream to the if I can actually learn to type I actually stream to that channel where I am helping raise money for extra life so thanks everybody for coming in hope you stick around uh, the Wednesday night streams are particularly funny, but and thank you for that. It's it's me, the Wonk. Hopefully, I can catch your next stream. So, did we trade anything? We did a little bit. Cool. Uh, we got some, we got some components and some a couple more meals. Now, I should add on the title it says modded. We were playing with more mods, but we were having some sync issues, so we've just cut it down to just the multiplayer mod. So this is vanilla with multiplayer. And of course, everybody probably agrees that vanilla is rough. The vanilla can be rough. For me, it's more I like I like some interface tweaks more than all the extra items that you can get. Yeah. So right now it's. Oh, let's see. What I'm missing right now is the rim HUD. Oh, rim HUD is. See people's status, their abilities, just yeah. Working, you know, but uh, considering the topic, we're talking about being overwhelmed by things and the technical issues that happen when we try to play this game multiplayer. If you've got other things going on, like a stream, it can be really hard to manage those. For us, at least, it can be really frustrating. Yeah. Haven't played it in ages. Uh, well, Moulet Fritz, is that how you say that? Or Moulet Fritz? not sure that that's french on the front end with a little german on the end <laughs> it's, it's what it feels like it's a french french start with a german finish there's probably a wine that's got that description but yeah the the multiplayer side of this is it it's fun but it can it can be a little finicky when you start adding in lots of mods and we didn't have any mods that had they were all supposed to be completely compatible and yeah. in the past you know we've had uh, various degrees of success various degrees of success doing that you know playing a multiplayer game with mods but just i mean as soon as we started 
get it desynchronized, mm -hmm. get, it, get it functional, and not wanting to use the stream time uh, to... That was me. I, I absolutely did not want to troubleshoot this game. No, not all. today. Not today. So here, let me go ahead and switch back to the game. So you guys got that on your screen. And thank you also for that follow, oh, Frem. There's some cheese. It's over there. Go, go grab some. But I got to set Mondays. up the cheese currency system here. So go ahead. Uh, Mondays when we play, we try to play a game that isn't, that the game itself isn't terribly interesting. So, you know, we're playing slow. We're not really focused a whole lot on the game itself because we try to talk about our mental health. Or doing something like this where we're both playing the same colony so we can both manage. Exactly. So the game itself isn't the focus. Uh, we're both veterans with PTSD. And we both think that there's not enough conversation about mental health in the world, let alone um, in the gaming community. And to be able to offer insights into what it is to live the life that we live um, mm -hmm. you know, it might be it might be talking with somebody who was in a mass shooting it might be talking oh. you know about our own experiences today it's the hyper vigilance that's something that i want to talk about speaking of that one is working uh, we had we we brought on the game mechanic who's a partnered streamer of civ 6 and he talked about his experience I, I knew that he had ptsd and was in recovery i wasn't aware of what it was until he came on and shared it and he was he survived a mass shooting. He wasn't one of the targets, but he was there when it was going on. And so he talked about that experience and what his road to recovery has looked like. And you can catch that interview. That that URL will take you right to the point where he comes on the show. And yeah, we were playing RimWorld during that too. Were we? <laughs> yep. Um, I think that was before we started having as many problems. Yeah, we most most of them most of them just come down to all the mods. There's just a balance of how much do you want to play versus how much do you want all the little extras. And I today I just wanted to play. I was like, let's go vanilla. <laughs> and and I'm happy because the last thing I wanted to do was was more troubleshooting. Oh yeah. Oh, what was it? I talked earlier about the one of the the things that starts setting you on the road to being triggered and being hyper vigilant was all the little things that just are, that you know should, should work, but just suddenly yeah. don't work. I mean, everybody can understand. Uh, everybody can understand that frustration. The, what for us, where that where it differenti differentiates itself is that we have a hard time already with managing all of the the, the extra sensory input that we're taking and the the fears and other worries that we have with just experiencing emotion and stuff. So then, when you add something. That you, you're like, I just want to play a game. Let's turn it on and play. And then for some reason it doesn't work. That's just another layer onto all of that. That makes yeah. it hard to focus and do the things that you just you just want to do. Like last night wanting to watch an episode of a TV show with my wife. And for some reason Plex just stopped working. And today it was even with no settings having changed between Saturday and today. It just got worse today. And I don't know what it was. One of the things that I'll, I'll constantly talk about is how, <clears throat> because of the PTSD, everything in life goes from, or everything that's normal in terms of stress management is out the window. Um, things that you used to be able to process, things that you used to be able to take care of, things that you used to be able to cope with are gone every little stressor becomes a huge stressor it, it's the, the capacity for stress management that's just out the window yeah I have a very it's I, for me it ebbs and flows but yeah it's a very similar there's when I think at this point for me it's more when there's just too much of it at one time mm -hmm. yeah. so the I guess I'd say the most immediate, it's saving, it's saved. The most immediate example that I could think of is still the whole idea of going for a job interview. That's rough. <laughs> because it's... So many layers. Yeah. 
so many layers because there's the driving side of it. There's all the stress of preparing yourself, choosing the outfit, making sure that you, you know, you you prepare yourself mentally for questions. And then, then there's that hit, the, the whole idea of someone's going to be sitting there staring at you and judging you through the entire process. Functionally and deciding the outcome of everything that matters in your life. Yeah. And that, that that sets that well i'm done i'm i'm done for the day at that point just thinking about it <laughs> now it's gotten a little bit better in terms but again it depends on where you are are you in a safe space i have i have recently been more willing to put myself i get i don't say put myself out there but take a chance at doing things inside that class that I have at church because the class has shown me over a period of several months that they they will adapt so that I feel comfortable. I've, I've described it before on the channel, the whole, if I'm, if I'm talking, none of them will look directly at me. Yeah. If they see I need to speak, I'll just, because I'll raise my hand, people at the tables will, 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 kind of do a little hand signal to everybody at the table and they've all learned what the hand signal is. Guthron, no, they don't call me Guthron, but (laughs) Guthron, his hand is up. And over time, it's getting easier to speak up and I think they're catching on because some of them have started, you know, kind of looking my way. I think it just really depends on how I I am each day, but that that in and of itself, having people that that can understand and tell when you're having a better day than not the I think I told you about the experience I had going to see the Muppets did I tell you about that that was that was Groot, Groot's first experience with the movie and for the most part it was it went well there was some he got a little antsy through the movie but he didn't make any noise and we made it all the way through I didn't have to take him outside but on our way out I made it was on two different floors between where the theater was and where our exit was. But these were large floors, so large that they had a sub-level on the way down that you could stop on, on the stairs. And I didn't realize that when I took him down the stairs. So we got there, and we were looking down over a hockey rink because it's in a mall, it's got, I don't, it's got a hockey rink. Yeah. The, for some reason, he panicked. It's like trembling, shaking. And I was already stressed from finding the bathroom and dealing with him in the bathroom and dealing with other people who can they come into the bathroom want to talk to him while I'm trying to do what I need to do and then coming back out and realizing I didn't know where everybody was and then feeling lost so then when I find when I got down to that level I was already stressed and I think he was picking up on that and then there was all of these noises that I'm sure he could hear that I couldn't hear from the arcade from the hockey rink from the people in the mall from the people in the, above us in the theater that he started he started panicking. Hey, Arnos was dead. Welcome on in. And Howdy, welcome back. It stressed me out. That it, it pushed me to the point where I was having a hard time just talking to other people. So, and we had friends from this class with us, pretty much our only friends here. And when we got on the theater, I mean, on the theater, on the elevator, I took him into the corner and, and knelt down next to him. I'm talking about Groot, my dog, and kind of wrapped my arms around him. He was shaking really hard. My wife moved up to stand next to me and she's wearing a skirt and she put her arms on her hips and spread her legs with the skirt. So she was kind of forming a wall and my friends, they moved on either side of her with their backs to me and basically formed a wall of flesh around me and the dog so that we would feel safe Nice. without, yes. without nice. me asking for it, without anything. They just, they saw what state I was in, what state the dog was in. And as soon as we were in, they just, they just formed, cause there was more people trying to get on the elevator. They just blocked off that corner. That, that's huge, having people that will do that without you even needing to say that you need it. Yeah. So I've made a lot of progress with stuff like that in that environment, but outside of that environment, I'm still, I still don't feel that comfortable. Oh, yay, what do we find? A small hole in the wall. <laughs> Mad raccoon. Oh, that's our first... Uh... It's all, the, it's all the way over there. It's going to be a while till it gets to us. Yeah. Is that is that, is that you saying hi? Here, I'll say hi back. I think I need to do the whole thing. Yep, there we go. All right, 
Where is your medic? It's coming. Uh, that turkey is unconscious but not dead. Yep, it's set to hunt, so when it dies, if it bleeds out, it will uh, be... It will be... Uh, It'll be picked up. It'll be available. Yeah, it won't be forbidden automatically. Aw, oh, he's he's sad about the bird. But the bird the bird is dead. <laughs> is it allowed? Yeah, yeah, now it's allowed. There we go. Yeah, so if they die when they're if they die when they're set to hunt, I think they're automatically allowed. Well, that's cool. So how about you when it comes to the idea of going up, going to a place where people are going to look at you Howdy, it's me, the wonk. and watch you talk? How? Oh, that's obscenely difficult. Yeah. I used to love being the center of attention my entire life. Uh, you know, growing up as the majority of the, well, actually, I guess it's not the majority of my life as a result anymore. But uh, growing up, up until Afghanistan, I loved being the center of attention. The idea of being... Yeah, I know. I played cello. All my There's a reason why we let you do all the briefings. Exactly, yeah. Besides, so, besides the fact that you were the walking encyclopedia on what we were doing. <laughs> we had... Oh, the Air Force sent a bunch of muckety-mucks, you know, like generals and, and whatnot. The Dog and Pony Show. The Dog and Pony Show, exactly. That's what we would call it. And I would always, you know, volunteer to go like give the briefings. Be like, this is what's going on here. This is what's going on there. Going up on stage um, as uh, playing the cello, or when I did, you know, like uh, talent shows with band, you know, introducing anything. It's just, I, you know, I, I loved, loved uh, the center of being the center of attention. And then, then comes Afghanistan. And if you look at me, I want to hide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's... Oh, Captain Oz, welcome back. Thank you for that host. I do need to adjust the sound on those. I had them set better for sh for Streamlabs OBS. I need to, I think I need to retweak them one more time. Okay. Because they may... I'm not sure how much louder they are than everything else, but... Uh, yeah, thank you very much. We're still here. Welcome back in. So anyway, you were saying, after Afghanistan, look at me and I panic. Exactly. So being the going from being the center of attention, wanting to be the center of attention, to wanting absolutely nobody to see me. Um, if I'm in a crowd, somebody glances at me. I'm just like, go away. You know what? Meeting people, you know, meeting women at bars is that's that doesn't happen anymore. Um, just such a fundamental change from what you used to be yeah it's I mean even coming here and talking about this it's difficult it, I know it's difficult um, not being able to put a face or, or a real identity to anybody that comes into chat or um the anonymity does help. Anonymity helps. You know, most everybody knows my name is Mike. People know that we're veterans, but but that's different. You know, it's but even then, it's still exhausting. I guess. Oh yeah, I can't. Yeah, I I often feel very after streams, whether it's this one or my Wednesday night level head stream on my channel or especially the extra live stream on Fridays to the ba the main extra live channel that mm -hmm. when I'm done with that one I feel very tired I actually asked them this past weekend actually this last week so before I did the one on Friday but we didn't change it for last week but this week we did I asked to be moved up a slot because I needed a little more time between when my extra live stream ended and when my family came home <laughs> because <laughs> I would finish and there's a lot more there are a lot more viewers on that one, and I know there are a lot more viewers. And yeah. even though I try, I I don't know if it comes across in streaming. I think I hide it really well, but I am aware that they're there. And when I'm done, I have to 
I have to take a break. I need to go. I usually take the dog for a walk and that, and I just focus on him and that can help. But sometimes I need to actually go lie down. Yeah. And this is as safe an environment as you're going to find. Most people, I mean, yeah, they see my face, but most of the people in the encounter here are not people I know in real life. I've, I think I've met maybe one or two people in total that I know through streaming in real life. Yeah. Um, a story, I, I think I've told this this particular story on stream before, but I'm not sure. Um, one of the, the patrols we were doing, or a mission, I don't, I think it was preparation for a uh, protection for a convoy so mm-hmm. where it was in afghanistan was was uh, kind of far in the east uh, right along the border with pakistan and it's in the hindu kush mountains and although it's yeah, by a number of one of the, one of the worst places in the country you know it's, it's mountains that are inhabited by people that want americans dead and um there, you know, being in the mountains, there was only one major canyon going up um, to all of the towns and, and bases and stuff north of us. And so all of the supplies coming out of Pakistan, all of the supplies coming up from Jalalabad would come up through our, our valley, our mountain valley. And so we were one of a couple of units that would have to provide security for the convoys. I mean, we're talking huge convoys um, of supplies and food that would would get sent up that valley and so we were out um just prepping the area prepping the valley for the the monthly convoy and what the you know we had our own little convoy five or six um, armored trucks Mm -hmm. and our truck was in the back and then the the platoon leader you know like the the leader of the of the convoy was in the front and so there was two interpreters there was one in the front with the platoon leader and then there was one with us uh, because of, of what we did we needed our own interpreter but so that meant that when one of the front trucks uh, hit an IED and was disabled uh, we had to stop in the middle of the road and wait for a wrecking truck to come but this this mountain valley you know it was tiny roads you know you couldn't traffic couldn't pass us while we were stopped waiting for a wrecker to come Mm -hmm. um, nobody could pass and so traffic started building up behind us which is in and of itself like you know a big threat because keep in mind this is a part of the world where you know there's a lot of people that want us dead and so uh being in the rear truck with an interpreter they asked us to go and just talk, just uh, have a chance, like go look in the cars, talk to the people, see if anybody looks nervous, see if there's any weapons, any bombs, things like that, you know? So um, so I went, it was just me and the interpreter. You know, the interp- interpreters aren't armed in Afghanistan. Um, American, you know, interpreters are Americans. They're not armed, they're not military generally. I mean, there's different cases, but you know, so it was just me in the interpreter, and walking away from our convoy from car to car to car to car, going further and further and further and further away from, you know, whatever semblance of safety we had. Looking for weapons, looking for bombs, uh, trying to get an idea if anybody was was going to be a threat. Mm -hmm. And then, when we you know, as the hours go by and we finally get the disabled truck away and pulled out and people start passing. Um, we had earlier in the day gotten some, you know, some radio chatter talking about <clears throat> somebody, uh, you know, they were, they were prepping for, cause they knew the convoys were happening. So they were prepping for an attack on the convoy yeah. and trying to get supplies and stuff staged. And we, we knew that that was happening, but we didn't have any information necessarily on where it was going to be like where people were going to be going to, where they were going to be staging from. And then, so after all this traffic moved past us, you know, things were on the move again, we heard radio traffic saying, 
hey, we were stuck in this in the traffic jam behind the con, you know, behind the Americans, uh, but we're through now. We're going to go ahead and attack. And all I could think of was one of those people that I was just standing right next to is one of the people that is trying to kill us. Oof. You know, is like yeah. so I was, so yeah, so the interpreter and I were just leaving the convoy, walking out, which is not something you do in a war zone. You know, you do not go out on your own. No. Period. End of story. Like, that's just, it's asking to be kidnapped. It's asking to be, um, generally they'll, they would try to kidnap you before they would try to kill you and hold you for ransom. But it was like, yeah, so I now know that at least one of the people there probably was thinking about just shooting me. Or snatching me, and that would have been it, you know. So the, the anonymity, strangers, strangers, people, you know. I would say that ninety-eight percent of people that we experience in our lives, day-to-day -day lives, are safe. But when the cost of being out in public means you're at those two percent, and I, I don't know what this is actually, but you know, when when you're you're facing people every day in your existence when you're out in public who want really bad things to happen to you. Explains a lot about your 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 form of hypervigilance. Um, well, that last comment, that was talking about in real life for everybody. Yeah. I mean, the, the story, the story you were just talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mentioned it earlier how at the end of my time on active duty... It seemed to me that everything and everyone was just trying to to keep me trapped in a job that I knew was bad for me and I didn't want to keep doing yeah. that. And I actually had paper evidence that, that at least some of the leadership was intentionally sabotaging my career because let's just say they don't handle whistleblowers very well. Yeah. Like at all, even though they're not supposed to Rules do stuff like that. There are lots of rules against retribution. Doesn't matter. You know, once once the eyes are gone, and I actually had I had I got the paper evidence in January of 2016 that they were actively trying to sabotage my career, and that was around the time, same time that I had made the decision. It's time I have to get out of here. Hmm. So the longer that went on, the more. To me, all of these people who were supposed to be my who were supposed to be my coworkers just morphed into this silent bunch of people who I didn't know who was thinking what or doing what. And if you know that you were if you know that you're a target and you don't know who's doing the targeting, every everybody becomes a risk in, in it's it's sad. It shouldn't be that way. Mm -mm. You know, we're social creatures. Like we thrive on on having people around us. But when the people around us are a threat, either actively or like actively being that, or passively by not by not once they realize what's going on, not showing support. Yeah. And then just to compound that, when I did finally leave. Almost everyone from that I knew from that that location, even when they moved elsewhere, almost all of them stopped talking to me. Like the instant I left, it it just like out of sight, out of mind. And so then I'm sitting there thinking, "Wow!" So not only did you guys know what was going on and just you know not ever even say a word to me along the lines of some kind of "Hey, it's tough, man." anything like that but as soon as I left you guys just all essentially extricated me from your life excommunicated me from your life so then I'm thinking back to all those times and it just compounds onto that like wow so not only were you passively not doing anything but as soon as I as soon as I left you essentially ghosted me that's not going to help with that paranoia <laughs> that's just going to exasperate it
So and it takes it takes having so the threat that strangers present us. Like I said, it's not everybody. It's it's usually a very small percentage of people that are a threat to anybody. But it takes seeing or experiencing having been damaged by people who are supposed to be there for you mm -hmm. to then feel to then really feel the threat that exists day to day. Oh, and, I, and I've mentioned this before on my exit. I got to do exit interviews. Yeah. And one of them was with the then superintendent who used to be my flight chief slash supervisor. And on my way out, this person told me that they wished they were in my position finally leaving and that that's why they had done everything they could to stay out of operations because they didn't want, they couldn't do it anymore. And this was one of the people who had made my life miserable throughout. I mean, it wasn't, he did good things as a supervisor, but there were times when acting as the fl the flight chief, I was just dumbfounded when he said that. That's, uh... You agree with me and you know why you you understand my reasoning and you would join me if you could. Yet every step of the way where you could have stepped in and helped, you didn't. <laughs> Admiral McRaven, one of the former um, commanders of Special Operations Command, was giving testimony. And I forget whether it was the House or the Senate, whether it was the Intelligence Committee or whether it was... Um, it was one I of them. I don't remember which committee it was. But he was giving testimony, and I, I just happened to catch this. I sometimes like watching things like C-SPAN. It's... I I actually care like what happens in our country and, and, and in our in our government really matter to me. So I do things like watch C SPAN sometimes. Um, Whereas me, I just avoid all of that crap. Yeah. Uh, uh it's Captain Captain uh, Captain Oz, I'll I'll tell you this hypervigilance is is sort of like being hyper aware of everything around you to the but to the point of your you're always on your guard because you fear your safety. So it's not just being extra aware of all that's going on around you. It's in, it's you add that extra sense of I'm in danger because I don't feel safe. Oh yeah. It's paying attention to all the sounds, all the movements, everything you can see, everything that could be happening and assessing its risk and threat. And everything constantly wondering about the things that you're not aware of. Like, when is somebody going to come up behind me? When is somebody just going to appear around an idol, uh, around an aisle? When is somebody going to swerve in front of me? When is somebody going to just insert themselves into my world and demand that I interact with them? All of these things, you're, you're thinking about that while you're dealing with all of the sensory input and the it just it becomes overwhelming. <laughs> and as I mentioned before, you get these, there's three responses, fight, flight, or, or flee. And I tend... I tend not to flee so much as I will freeze first. So fly, fight. No, yeah, so fly, fight, free. Yes. Fight, flight, freeze. Fight, flight, freeze. <laughs> I tend to freeze. Whereas Chellis Mike tends to fly, to flee. And I think that's interesting because of how he experienced his, his trauma versus how I experienced mine. He was in a place where if you froze, you were dead. I was in a place where freezing meant people stopped paying attention to you. As long as you flew under the radar, they would stop paying attention to you. So it made sense to freeze. It made sense not to fight, not to run away. Because if I ran away, then they'd, they'd be thinking, where is he? Why isn't he at work? Why isn't he doing this? So if I just vanished into what I was doing, just blended into the background, made myself as inconspicuous as possible, yeah. which proved difficult because I was one of the more experienced techs at the job. I, I, I was Literally, I was a tech sergeant, but I was I had a decade's worth of experience doing the work we were doing, and I was put in charge of the, the office that ran all of that stuff. So it was impossible to stay hidden all the time, but I just learned how to hide. Yeah, so you take uh, Captain Oz, if you think about when you're out in public, all of the the things that you're hearing, that you're seeing, that you're smelling, that are touching you. So all of that, take all of that. Uh, I came into this with 
with a problem of sensory input, sensory processing difficulties because I have ADHD. My daughter actually had full blown had a sensory processing. sensory processing disorder, so she needed. We got care for her early on because we couldn't touch her, we couldn't hug her, we couldn't cuddle with her at all. It was just, it was that bad, and so we had to get her special therapy to help her be able to deal with it. So you go into it with that, the inability to to properly process all the sensory input to, or to just ignore it, and then compound that with the trauma from that uh, that I witnessed and then how it was compounded by things that people were doing some of which I've discussed here some of which I haven't because I'm just not ready to yet and because that what we did starts triggering the everybody the, uh, turns moral, into a the moral injury side yeah everybody turns into a danger I, I was just speaking about the people who didn't do anything who didn't speak up to me and say hey I understand you know, if you need to talk or something, or, hey, I don't really understand this, but I understand you're struggling. No one was doing that. Everyone was either actively trying to make sure that whatever happened to me was the worst possible outcome, or was delaying everything to the point that it took me 14 months to finally get them to make a decision about letting me go. I was six, five weeks away from having the PCS back to a place that I didn't want to go, and before they finally said, okay, we'll let you go. And in the end, it turned out that the entire delay was on the side of my of my unit and stuff like that. As, uh, AFPC had approved it immediately. But it took nine months just to get my unit to let AFPC see it. It's So then when all of these people who you, we, they were your coworkers, they were your brothers and sisters in arms, they were the people who were supposed to be looking out for you and talking about supervisors and flight chiefs and commanders, the people who are there to make sure that you can do your job were actively... Yeah, either by, by passively, just not even letting you know that they're aware that you're having a problem, or actively trying to make life difficult for you. It turn it makes it it turns everybody into a into a danger point. You don't know who is going to do what next, and, and so that that's sounds, that sounds like you know a, a, an incredibly strange you know why in a in a place that's supposed to be so professional why would that sort of thing happen, but. This is this is where uh, what Admiral McRaven said comes into play. Um, he was testifying. I don't. Re- like I said I don't remember who he was testifying to. Whether it was it was a, a, a subcommittee in the Senate or the House. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how uh, the U.S. military has been in conflicts for so long on so many fronts that there's there's this this imbalance between what people are actually capable of accomplishing and then the tasks that are, are given. Oh, yeah. What, what has to be done, you know, compared, uh, compared to what can be done, everybody is so overworked, so overwhelmed all the time. Yeah, I like to call it the... An, an entire burnout of yeah. an industry, of a, of a... The entire military is just burnt out and it's it, it's just never stops the pressure just never it just keeps stops. going never and stops. and when you have a uh, when you have a group of people whose entire way of thinking about soldiers airmen sailors marines is okay we break one we could just have another one come back from train get come out of training in a couple of weeks in a career field where that was actually not true like linguists, it could take, and like in the career, the language I was in, it would be two years before you got another one like me, and that person would be brand new, and not have the decade and a half experience doing the job. So that wasn't actually true. Oh, and I had a thought I was going to share it, but, but oh yeah, the um, yeah you have you know the when you're just you know a little a little worker bee, all you get is just pressure. Mm-hmm. When you're in charge, you're now also the person who has to put all the little, all the little worker bees in pressure because at the end of the day, no matter how much you care or don't care about people, the job has to be done. And there's someone and there's over someone you to basically treating you the same way. Yeah, and it's the job has to be done, period, always. 
And it's also in a world where everyone fall, everyone just falls back on the, I hate to put it this way, but they fall back on the, I'm just doing my job. So in this case, I'm thinking the letter of the rule, the letter of the law, as opposed to the spirit of it. Yeah. Everyone when just... It comes to military operations, human rights are not an issue. You know what mm -mm. I mean? It, what I mean is not an issue as... What I, what I mean by saying... Not a priority. Is, it's not a priority. Mission comes first. Even the job I'm in now, which is taking care of airmen, is all about what can you do to get them back to me functionally so that I can then put them back in danger. Mm -hmm. Which, if you've seen the show Homecoming on Amazon Prime, is an entire show that deals with that. Yeah. So, uh, but on the topic that you were saying about the people, you know, the worker bees, the constantly feeling overwhelmed, I referred to it at the when I was in, and I still refer to it as the just one more thing syndrome. syndrome. Someone up here decides this is going to be an, a task that has to be done. And so it gets assigned to the worker bee down at this level. And on its way down, it hits another level where that person adds another thing to it. It's just one little thing. Just one more thing. And every layer, every layer on the way down until it gets to you, everyone's adding one. So by the time you get from here, where it was just one thing down to here, it's 20 extra things. And suddenly you're not going home when your shift is over because you have to stay an extra hour to take care of all of these just one more things. And when they're cutting cutting funding and cutting manning left and right, you just feel this constant pressure of if you don't if you don't perform, then you're not you're not giving us you're not giving us what, what we need, what we require what we require. And so then you get that pressure on top of it. So then you get people uh, coming down with severe mental health disorders. Well, and when we started, remember, the providing adequate support for people who had some kind of mental health difficulty was mm -hmm. lacking entirely. Yeah, it, I mean, even, <laughs> yeah. How many so, people just refused to go get help because they were convinced, even yeah. though it wasn't true, they were convinced that they, if they did, they would lose their job. Because well, for a while, it was true. But then even when the rules changed, no one let, in no, practice, no. It's still true. In, in practice, it's very true. Yeah. But they, t that if you could prove that they're doing it, then they get in trouble. But that's the difficulty in proving it because everything always has that mission allows caveat or, you know, they're a danger to mission. Like you yeah. can't perform the job. We can't have you doing this. So in, in essence, they've done exactly the same thing. And people in the military cannot sue. The federal government. Mm -mm. They have no, and they have no union protection. No union protections. They can legally treat you like slaves. Well, I mean, essentially, they own your body. Yeah, like, I and mean, you have to ask permission to just get a tattoo or an earring. Um, it's a line of work where if you don't show up, you can go to jail. Oh, especially for us. Yeah, most everybody else, they would have. Was it twenty-four hours before they're declared a wall? For us, it was one hour. And even if you had a reason, if it took them an hour and they had to send the police for you, you were going to jail one way or the other. Yeah, you may be exonerated or not charged with anything. But that doesn't mean everybody wants to look that at you. Mean, like, yeah, that doesn't mean you don't leave in cuffs. Yeah. I, I almost experienced that once when I put in a, a day off back when I was first at Georgia. And... I was at home and they sent two worker bees to come come get me and say you're supposed to be at work and I just stared at them for a second and then I did without answering them, I just pulled out my cell phone and called work and said I have a pass day and it's in the schedule you approved it why are there two airmen here not doing their job trying to drag me into work when I'm not supposed to be there person never admitted that they made a mistake so they just no. told them hey, since you're on the since I'm talking to you tell them to come back I mean you and I you know, we, we left that environment and we're broken people because of it. But it the environment can be so, so damaging. Uh, we had a good friend, a uh, co-worker, good friend. Uh, Mike was, Clarity was 34. Oh my goodness. That's a friend who... I have, that story still makes me so mad. Who was functionally screaming for help for mm -hmm. years for years saying i can't take it i can't take it i can't take it and they never got him out of that job 
they just and kept he, making it so that he was critical and couldn't be couldn't be moved. And he had a heart attack at work. He was what was he, was he thirty four? Thirty four, I think it was. And he actually went to the hospital the day before. And the doctors, their their job is just to get you back to work. They didn't they didn't diagnose it correctly. They just did the bare minimum and sent him back to work. And the next day he died. Yeah. So yeah, he got back to work all right. That, and that because that was the environment. You have to. What it, what can we do? The bare minimum cost expense and then get you back to work yeah and it's, it's like it's not it wasn't like a workplace accident where you know he's lifting heavy things and something fell it wasn't slipping on a surface it was literally dying from stress mm-hmm. but that's so, yeah. just the environment and yeah so so you have people like us that come back and come out broken. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, that, that it's just, we, we do so much um, as a country. We just, we, we put so much effort, so much time, so much money into something. And it's, it's beyond what we're capable of doing. And they aren't prepared. They aren't prepared, really, for the for the consequences of those choices. No. In fact, they constantly they constantly fight us. They constantly fight us on the whole. The okay, so you're broken, and now we have to pay for it. But we're going to do our darndest to not pay for it. Sure, you. Yes. Like, what can we do? What can we do to absolutely give you the bare minimum? For all of the trouble that we've caused you, and it is a constant fight. I cannot go to the VA alone anymore. I avoid I'm it like the, the plague. People I know who I feel like actually got adequate help from the VA. Like everybody else that I know, everybody else that I've talked to with similar problems, they don't get enough help. Mm-mm. When you're, when you're left in a situation where you can't work, uh, yeah, well, you can't work. It's, look, it's something that pays so little you can't have a roof over your heads. I got, so. I got, eventually got, you know, they tried to give me help, but what did they do? They tried to force me into a model that, what, that wasn't going to work because it didn't, what the problem that I had didn't fit inside their nice little box. And so I had to go find help on my own. Well, I'm talking about financial help. Well, I mean that too. I was trying to say that with that same money. No, I was talking about the mental health part. The VA's, yeah, too, yeah. the VA's mental health clinic here where I live, essentially dr- abandoned me. They dropped me like a hot potato. Had I been a, a more serious risk, then, well, I mean, what could that have led to? How, I mean, we've we already know that the that the suicide rate among uh, veterans is much higher than any other demographic. Had I not had the support that I had at home to help me find the, the, the care that I needed elsewhere, that could very well have been me. But as far as the VA was concerned, they didn't care. I didn't fit inside their box, and so they just dropped me. I mean, they made mo- they did, went through the motions of trying to get me into a different type of care. But then as soon as that process was started, the person who was assigned to me dropped me, never even bothered calling. And then the person who was supposed to pick me up dropped me, never, never began calling. So I mean, when I went, when I went to to Alabama, I had I hadn't received any kind of professional help in three months before that. Is it any wonder that I had a breakdown there? Yeah. And then I went to Germany, having just found a person that I could interact with over the over the internet. And I mean, I had that, so thank goodness I had that, and she was helpful. She still is. She actually a guest appeared on our on our show. And it talked about the therapy that I went through. And thank goodness I had that because what they had in Germany was, wasn't going to help me any. Not at that base. They, it was, what can we do? Bare minimum to get you back and functional. So, there's a lot of frustration in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and now... Um, I was going to put in a research desk right, th- right here. Is that okay? Oh, you did it. So, and now what? 
damage to what's around you can do with it. <clears throat> and now we're in a place, or you're in a place, where um, you have been working and working and working and working and trying to take care of yourself. Um, you're able to find a way to supplement your income a little bit. A little bit. From home. Um, I mean, you, you're not in any kind of a place where, where money or finances are easy. Mm -mm. Um, but you have options. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've got... But most of that I had to find on my own because the VA... And that one side of the VA said you're not functional enough to work, and then the other side that I went to to get help with that said no, you're too functional for us to help you. <laughs> like, come on, guys, somebody should talk to each other here. But it also, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, no matter what anybody else says, or no matter what anybody else has responsibility to do or help or accomplish. The one person you can't give up on is yourself. Yeah, and that, that book that I shared earlier, the, the Man's Search for Meaning book, he talks about that like throughout the book, this whole... Uh, and they were in the most desperate of si desperate situations, and the people that made it, outside of some fluke, something fluke happening, like suddenly somebody going rampage and deciding to shoot them all, or they caught a disease or something, you know, the ones who... Hey, Scarbrand, thanks for that follow. Welcome on in. The the So the ones who didn't face any of those random occurrence challenges that were constantly be, they were being constantly exposed to, the one they the thing that got them through it was that the one thing that you can't take away from me is my choice of what kind of person I'm gonna be here. To keep trying. Yeah, to keep trying. Um now that didn't work for all of them. But the, the the author described what he what he witnessed there, of what what people who made the choice to 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 have some kind of choice in how they were going to respond to things, versus the the ones who just gave up. And he described it as there was three stages: there was shock, there was apathy, and then there was giving up, and you know the end. And the he said the ones that made it through. You know, through the apathy stage and didn't hit that third stage were the ones that, like Scarbrand said, don't stop believing. And now I got that song stuck in my head. Thank you. I know that's why you did that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although my favorite rendition of that song is actually Don't Stop the Sandman, which, if you haven't heard that mashup, you definitely need to go look it up on YouTube. It's by Rock Sugar. I, I discovered it on the morning stream. Okay. Love that rendition of it. It's a mashup of Don't Stop, you know, Believing and Inner Sandman. <laughs> they go surprisingly well together. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's that's it. That you did. What kind of person are you going to be in, or, or believing in something that's greater than yourself? Exactly. What, so, I am. I, I am not a believer. However. I can't tell you just how much I wish I could. Well, okay, let's. Well, let, 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 there are there are the there are people who will listen who who aren't. There are things that you can believe in that are greater than yourself, even if you don't have a faith, yeah. like being kind to others. Yes, there you go. So you can choose something that's more. And in the example in the book, he's describing he's he talks about those who chose. To, to be all about themselves and they actually actively took part in the oppression of their own people and then those who just decided they were going to no matter what they were going to take care of their th th those around them even if that meant that they ended up dying but you had two different people in the exact same situation choosing two different reactions to the same thing Oh, she's attacking our dog, Oksana. No. Leave Okra alone. <laughs> wow. You might need to send... Hey. Let's see, what has she got? Mining, shooting. And she's incapable of caring. 
and she's psychically sensitive. Five hours. Ah. Well, that would be good, except we don't have a prison. We'd have to quickly build one. And I don't think we can build one in time. Mm -mm. So, let her die. Yep. Don't forget to strip her before she dies. Yeah, I just said the strip. So, yeah, that... I'm I'm only part way through that book, but yeah, it, that that whole finding something bigger than yourself to believe in, and that was one of the problems that I always had with the way the military tried to manage our career field was they tried to use the same jingoistic ways that they kept everybody motivated. You know, our mission is for a good thing, all that stuff like that. You're doing, you know, esprit de corps and all that stuff. It just and it just went right by us because not because we weren't aware of it, it was just because we saw right through it <laughs> you could say oh yeah sure we're you can say we're the good guys but i can list you know, list dozens and dozens of examples where it's questionable whether or not we're the good guys or not yeah like it, it, <laughs> ah, when you're talking about warfare good guy is so relative it's very you very relative about, you can talk about just how bad the other team did something like, oh, well, so-and-so did this absolutely horrible thing. Yeah. But you can't forget that war is brutal. War is very brutal. The idea of a good guy is complete bullshit. Yeah, and that... not I don't want to just... I don't want to keep going back to the book, but I'm currently listening to it, so it's these things are in my head right now. He even talked about that, how some people, even though they made the choice to be a better person would get to the point where even they would make decisions that they would later regret because circumstances forced it upon them and then they had to live with that for the rest of their life. Now, that part right there rings so true for me and you know why. The part, the thing that I don't, I, I'm not, we're, we'll talk about it soon, but I'm not ready to talk about it today. No. But those things that you do as a part of your job that even if you even if you intend them to be something good can still be twisted and then the whole do you like how much of that how much of that is your role in taking it what part did you play in that yeah that's when you start going down that road it's 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 a rough road it's a very rough road and i've spent most of my time just trying to get the control of the hypervigilance side of it and the, the fight, flight, or freeze stuff and the being overwhelmed by emotions, I haven't even been able to get to that part, which is the difference in your recovery versus my recovery, <laughs> is you've been at this longer, so you managed to get to that part. Yeah, I've been able to... Yeah, I first went to... I wouldn't say I first went to therapy. I first started in the therapy that ended up being helpful Mm -hmm. What was it? 2014. Yeah. It's like February. And when did the when 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 did the primary trauma happen? Wasn't that 2010? Uh, yeah, 2010 and 2011. Yeah. As well, and well, we've mentioned it before. I mean, the trauma started for you really before you left, with the loss of your best friend. Mm, yeah. So. The ground, the groundwork was was there. It's hard to say that, you know, if this was different or that was different or that was different. It's hard to say. Yeah, it's a domino effect. You don't know which domino might have changed it. Yeah. But I can tell you that the the person that left my house because he was staying with me, the person who left my house on his way, was even a little bit different from the person who came back to my house that evening before you finally opened up and talked about it. And it was my wife actually that got you to open up. And, and our bodies and our brains have a, just a massive capacity towards towards overcoming traumatic things, whether it be grief, like in that case, mm -hmm. or whether it be uh, moral injury, or whether it be life-threatening environments. Uh, you know, our brains, our bodies have a lot of capacity towards overcoming those sorts of things. Yeah. One of the problems is everybody also has the capacity to have that um, 
overwhelmed. Yeah. And not be able to recover from it. There's only so yeah, much. Yeah. It's different for everybody. Some people they have a higher threshold of that than others, but it's very there. There's there is a there is a threshold. There is a line where, where everybody breaks. Yeah, and and it's literally that. Yeah, it's your brain has now been rewired. And some of it requires just being just being made self-aware enough. I didn't understand what was happening, and to me, until I mean, it's a. I would have to say it's a combination of things. Yeah, but I would say a lot of it had to do with what when, when my wife started going through her training to be a, a licensed professional. She, that's when she started realizing all of the I things know. that were happening to me because she finally understood, and. As she was learning these things, I was learning these things. So I became self-aware. There are so many people that it, still in that world who I would say they they feel off, but they can't pinpoint what it is because they're just not self-aware enough, not not aware enough of what it is that's happening to them. It's you can tell that something's off, like you said, something's wrong, something's different, but that doesn't mean that you know what it is or what to do about it. So. And oftentimes the people around us will see the, di- the differences before we do ourselves. Oh, that's so true. And then it's... the people that knew you beforehand, if they knew you really well, like my sister, um, was she and her family had come down to help me move and she commented on just how different I was. And it was because she saw me growing up. She saw me all the way through my childhood and into my adulthood and then a person and even you know a few times as an adult and then all of a sudden she's presented with this completely different person yeah you know whereas for us it's very it, it's kind of a slow progression yeah well and even for the people who live with you it can be a sudden it can be a sudden thing but they it's but like you said they're there when it's happening and they're there, assuming that they stay there. They're they're there throughout the, the the progression and the road to recovery. So, the first the fall into the spiral down, and then all of that, assuming that they're they're aware. And that's one that we had we've had discussions on this too about how can you be of help to someone in your life that that's suffering from this. Hmm. Uh, so, I had a huge advantage with having art studying what she was studying and helping me figure it out what the things that I needed there are some questions about whether or not had I not been going to the therapy that I was going through in 2016 when all, when I was trying to separate there's some question about whether or not I would have still gone through it as if you know it would have been as traumatic but since I had already come to the realization that I needed to leave because I was done doing what I was doing, being being what I was for them. I at most I could say that that therapy just tore down the wall so that then I could finally have that break that I needed to say, yes, I this is I need this and it's the only and it's what kind of what got me through the last three months of trying to push to them for them to finally approve me to leave. Mm-hmm. I very likely would not have made the progress I did had I not been forced out. Yeah. Oh, well, which time are you talking about? Well, I wasn't forced out at the same time. No, no, I mean, the the, the whole... Remember, I remember you saying this, that the person who was working with you at the VA said that maybe you not being able to go back to work is what, is what was the motivation you needed to finally push to yourself to get the help that you needed. Um... Well, so I was already getting help, and I had even gone to the VA. Um, I was getting help from you know places other than the VA first, but it wasn't until I went up for that psychological evaluation that they said, "Hey, you have PTSD," because nobody had ever said that yet. Because of course, why would the military diagnose you? With PTSD? Oh, that that that's a that's a that's that a long road that they're putting you on when they diagnose you with that. Yeah, um, I had to fight for that diagnosis. Because they wanted to classify me as so many, so many other things first, and they did well, not want to allow. If you had been out of the military trying to work in that same 
environment as a as a contractor, you would have had to go through the same psychological exam as I did, and they would have told you the same thing if you had a PTSD, because they're not the ones that have to treat you or deal with it, so they're not hesitant. To yeah, do it, that's to, true. To, to say it. That's true. But so yeah, immediately after that, they suggested that I go to the VA, and I immediately. Um, it was, but the VA psychiatrist was the one that said, as long as you're working in this environment, you're not going to get better. Yep. So then when I was forced out, as much as it, it also triggered a huge spiral, I think being forced out also allowed for some recovery. That, that, that whole, that initial change, we talked about that, was it last week? Um, how, or the year, the week before, how, how change can be both a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> It is bad simultaneously years. loss of your career loss of your financial stability as stressful as those things are they're not as damaging for me as a person my own setup of who i am they're not as damaging to me as a person as the, the constant day-to-day -day moral injury of the work yeah isn't that the truth So it's almost 5.30. Yeah, and... Or and 6.30, or what is it, 4.30 your time. 4.30 my time. We went a little long today, but we were having a good conversation. Yeah, and it's been a while since we did uh, PTSD day, so... Sorry, I'm adjusting Making something. Bedrooms. Huh? Making bedrooms. Well, in this case, uh, I've yeah, I've blocked off the upper part, but I'm creating a spot if we wanted to, to put a prison. But I, I realized when I, the first way I did it was we were giving up too much space for the prison. So so that could quickly become a prison if we needed to, but it could be a bedroom. And then the other one was just to give the bedroom some form of privacy so they wouldn't keep getting the disturbed sleep. So, uh, yeah. All right, so let me switch this over. So thanks again, everybody, for coming and hanging out. We will be back next week with another conversation similar to this. Uh, we'll decide the topic. For the next couple days. So next couple I days. I mean, next week. I mean next oh, okay. Well, then I may be on my own. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. So. Um, yep. So everybody, say goodbye to Charles Mike. Uh, he may not be here next time. We'll see. And Bye, I'll I'll be right back for you. Right. Okay. So thanks again for. All the hosts, the follows, the raids, uh, I really appreciated all of that. It's me, the Wonk, for your raid and the new followers. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us while we talked about talked about something serious while we did something fun. So I'll be back Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Central, 7 Eastern, for another round of Levelhead, playing user-created levels. I'm loving that game right now, and I... Uh, I've had people actually like Friday. Someone made a level while I was on stream so that I could run my, you know, fa I could epically fail at it at the end of the stream. <laughs> so, and on Fridays I stream to the Extra Life channel, which I'm going to see if there's anyone playing on it to host them after this. But Extra Life for Kids on Fridays at noon, one cent, with noon Central, one Eastern, I will be streaming to that channel uh, you can see i'm doing the fundraiser up here i'm almost halfway through to my first goal uh, but on fridays i'm streaming to their channel where we talk about the main event and everything so i'll be back then and next week i may do this by myself we'll see so everybody have a good rest of your week thank captain oz scarbrand i'll see you i'll see you next time and we'll catch you later bye